Uh, well, thanks for coming, everyone, I'm both on Zoom and in the room here. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Kenyon. I'm a research librarian here at the university. I'm um, also an all-around uh, sciences librarian. So if you're in, in any of the colleges associated with science, natural resources, and at the moment, engineering too, um, I'm happy to help you with any questions or any issues that you might have. Um, just always, you can get in touch with me. My email's there uh, on the screen. Um, today, we wanted to talk about the concept of uh, data management, and we're going to kind of go through a list of about uh, seven or so uh, sort of ideas or concepts that will hopefully help you kind of do better at managing your data if uh, you were self-taught or if you were just sort of figuring it out and you didn't really have any kind of education in it. Hopefully, some of these things will be useful for you. Um, it's a little bit about me. I work with a lot of researchers to help them write data management plans. And I worked with the U.S. Geological Survey for about eight years, uh, working with researchers to write those plans, to make their data available publicly uh, through a bunch of federal websites. Uh, and so I've got quite a bit of experience working with a wide range, mostly in the environmental sciences, but a range of different kinds of researchers. So um, I've got some experience if you have any questions about specific things. Um, there's always something I find that somebody has a question about that I have no idea <laughs> how to answer, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, so let's get the PowerPoint working. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to take you through uh, some of the basic uh, the basic things to think about. I'm going to talk just a minute about the Data Hub, uh, a service we have here at the library, and then we'll get into the rest of it. So. Um, if, you're, if you've been here for a while, you this might be news to you. If you're new, maybe you've heard about this. Uh, we've got a location here in the library over in the map room uh, that we call the Data Hub. Um, and it's a place for us to provide support uh, for people working with GIS, with maps, with any kind of data science C question. Um, it's a place where you can come to get help if you've got nowhere else on campus to go to. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage any of you to come by. Um, we've got the desk in there staffed from 11 to 3 p.m. Um, Monday through Friday with somebody I'm on there sometimes, a GIS librarian is on there. We've actually got some new librarians coming here uh, in the next uh, couple of months, and some of them will be uh, staffing the desk as well. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to use it. And then besides that, you can kind of see in the picture, there are monitors in the wall, collaborative desks and tables, uh, all sorts of things for you to, to sort of get to work uh, uh, if you need a place to work. So you're always welcome to use that. The location is here on the first floor of the library. All right. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through uh, those seven tips uh, to make uh, your data management a little bit easier. And the first one is uh, one that I think many of us try to do, but I don't know we always do effectively, which is backing up your data and thinking through a plan for keeping your data backed up. And so specifically, um, we want to talk about this concept of three, two, one. Um, you want to come up with some way of keeping three copies of your data. Uh, two types of different media, and one of those being off-site. And in the old days, this used to be much more of a challenge. Today with cloud technology, it's a little bit easier to put your, your stuff in something like OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that that you use regularly. Google Drive's another one. It allows you to achieve some of these much more effectively. Um, and in some cases, yes, your data may be so large and complex that it's really not possible to do this. But hopefully, if you're dealing with data of that size, you're using a service like uh, the Research Computing and Data Services Unit here at U of I that can provide replication of servers and things like that. So they can make sure that there is, in fact, this backup happening um, through their systems. It may not be something you're actively doing to back it up. So either way, you want to think through these processes. If you're just dealing with a small project, a uh, set of spreadsheets, images, something like that. Um, you want to think about, you know, how can I have at least three copies? My local computer, the cloud, and then maybe a, uh, a hard drive of some sort, an external hard drive would be a way to keep it um, keep it around. So think through these these steps. Um, it's going to save your save your bacon if you, uh, you you know your computer explodes, which happens to people. <laughs> Uh, there's fires, other kinds of things that happen. Uh, sometimes your data is corrupted. Sometimes uh, people make mistakes. So you want to you want to sort of think through that process, and don't be caught uh, sort of relying on a single source for your data sets. Uh, any questions about that? Pretty straightforward, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and if anybody online has any questions, please feel free to jump in the chat. You can unmute and just interrupt me. Uh, it's a small group, so it's just fine. Okay. So tip number two is uh, never modify your raw data. You want to version it as you go. So as you're collecting data, um, you're going to want to think about ways of kind of off-ramping from your workflow to create a data set uh, at that stage of your data. And so I've got this kind of chart on here. This is a, an example of somebody doing an analysis using these two uh, data sets over on the left here in the room, uh, temperature data and salinity data. They're using R, so they're going to work through these processes. And at each of these blue stages, they are essentially outputting a data set that allows them to go back and review or look at that data again, just in case they made some kind of a mistake or had some issue somewhere in those green steps in there. And so it's important to just not get a data set or collect a data set and, and you know you feel like you got this great raw data set, you're ready to start, and then you immediately start modifying it. Instead, make a copy, start working on that copy. And then as you go through these various stages of transforming the data, cleaning it, adjusting it in various ways, um, create these derivative versions. Like that can become, in some cases, difficult if your data is very, very large. Um, it's, it's almost always a caveat here. Um, really large, really complex data is always a little bit of a special case. Um, but for any kind of standard project, I would say the average project, something like this is something worth doing. And so um, if you can at all, you know, think ahead and plan out your process a little bit. Say, I'm going to go through these steps and figure out where you're going to do it. Um, or you can just more organically, as you're going through the process, anytime you start engaging in a major transformation, just uh, kick out a, a version of that data set so you can come back to it later. And so think through all those kinds of things, and uh, it'll help you in case you have problems in the future. Come on in. Any questions about that one? What is I'm going to pause on like each of these steps and <laughs> ask for questions. Yeah. So if you were or maybe versioning your data more frequently and not just when large changes happen, mm -hmm. how would how would you recommend kind of keeping track of what's happening in each of those files? I mean, like maybe the files look really similar when you see them if it's an Excel sheet. But how would you know, like, the change you made on this day versus the change you made on this day? Well, I think it, it, it's probably a little bit of a judgment call if you you probably don't want to make that many copies. <laughs> if, you're, if you're just making a few changes, um, you, you want to think about it in terms of larger category changes. So like in, in the example here, you know, we've got a case where we have two separate data sets and then we're joining them. And so that's a big change, right? And then we went through all the process of cleaning, whatever that is, um, modifying categories, altering things, adjusting things in various ways. Um, that's a big change. And then the summary statistics, obviously, is a big uh, different data set. So you want to think through those and maybe curtail the amount of repetitive copies you're making. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get bogged down in excess files, I think. Yeah. Do you have a question? No, I was just a uh, recommendation. When you make a new copy, I usually do like something identifiable day by day yeah. instead of saying this is the latest version because yeah. you'll get multiple this is the latest version <laughs> so just put the date in the name and yeah. it's much faster to recognize it that way yeah yeah maybe i didn't say that because that's a tip coming up here pretty soon oh. so. <laughs> yeah i know sometimes and maybe this is talked about later but sometimes if you have like a another document uh -huh. saying here's what i did on this yeah day, yeah that log, log, a change log, 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 log. Your data is saved by date, and you can look back. Like my husband does a lot of stuff in SPSS, and he always keeps a syntax file. Yep. Okay. I'm not very good at doing that, but yeah. he gets mad at me. <laughs> always have a syntax file so you can go back to where you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think some of these techniques take a lot of discipline, like that. Um, and some of us have it, and some of us don't. <laughs> some of us can work on it. Some of us have trouble with it. Um, but yeah, figuring out a process that kind of makes sense is, I think, the key point here. Um, just making sure you don't get stuck at the end and you realize you have to go all the way through your workflow all over again. Um, that's key. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, one version that you can engage in 
um, aside from the date, is actually just um, copying the entire project folder periodically and zipping it up and archiving it. So if you have a very small data set, like a couple of spreadsheets or something like that, that's a relatively easy thing to do. Um, and then you can just arrange those by date. But I think in a lot of projects, you're, it's a little more complex to be able to do that. But uh, that's an interesting idea that you can't do. Yeah. Okay. Um, generally speaking, uh, the next step is for you know constructing spreadsheets, working with any kind of a, a data set. Um, think through uh, the kinds of data values you're using. Sometimes they're they're sort of dictated by the kind of work you're doing, and other times you have a lot of choice in how you want to phrase things or describe things. One of the best things you can do. Um, is to think about identifiers. So common identifiers that are used somewhat universally in your field uh, for things. And then certain things like language codes um, or uh, certain kinds of, uh, I guess like fight and plot codes might actually be more universal than you realize. Um, you just need to go find that sort of standardized list somewhere and begin using them. So any kind, any time you're kind of constructing one of these data sets, and this is an example of uh, publication data. And so if we were using this list of publications, uh, a DOI number is a very standardized kind of way of describing a certain object. If we use that, then other people, when they look at this data, can also then utilize uh, the data effectively without a whole lot of explanation. That's part of the reason why we want to use those standardized uh, components. Um, so anytime you can do that, it makes your life a little bit easier. Um, along with that is the general issue of uh, variable names and thinking about what you call things in your data set. Um, so variable names, attribute names, something like that. So this little chart gives you three different examples of that. Good names, pretty good alternatives, and things to avoid. So since I've got a few people in the room here, and people online can jump in if they want to as well, um, when we look at this top one that has max temp, um, what is going on here in the avoid column that makes it something we want to avoid? Yeah. Um, the space. So, so spaces are part of it, yeah. Because yeah, there are some uh, tools like GIS tools that don't want you to use spaces at all, but yeah. The parentheses, and the degree symbol, yep. Yeah, so these are sometimes special characters and different tools and command line systems and other things. So avoiding all of that as much as possible is usually a pretty good idea. You can always create another column that has the unit of measure as the as the column if you want to. Or as we're going to talk about in a second, you can create metadata that simply says this is all in Celsius and you don't really need to have it in the attribute name itself. Yeah. Um, how about uh, sex down here? What's what's wrong with the last one on the right? From a data management standpoint. It could be in the column, but it's possible there could be more than just those two things in the column. It, it could be, yeah. And uh, it could have a different meaning, I guess. Yeah, and 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 F could be different things. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean these are these are the actual data values here, as opposed to the name of the variable or the concept you're trying to cover. So yeah, try to avoid putting the data values in the title. Again, is what we'll talk with metadata. You can describe this elsewhere. You don't need to put it in your attribute names. And you can screw it up, kind of. Um, I guess maybe we'll do the this one too. Wait. What's wrong with W period? Right, <laughs> right. What is what is W? Yeah, yeah. That's the same kind of issue. Um, don't use abbreviations when you can use small words that are self-explanatory. Like, I think you'll never forget. You might forget. You might forget. <laughs> there's a there's a chart that I don't have in this slide deck um, that shows kind of your memory over time with data management, and it just sort of keeps declining. And then by the end of your career or before you pass away. Um, you're not going to remember anything you did at the beginning. And so it's a good idea, yeah, to, to capture that. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of other points, um, things to remember, things to think about. 
Um, if you're working with a data set where zero is an actual value, then use zero as a value, but don't use zero for something else uh, where you're saying like, I didn't have an observation. It isn't necessarily zero. You didn't have an observation, right? So come up with a code for that kind of a situation. Um, you can use negative 999, you can use NA, you can use null. It kind of depends again on the tools that you're using and what they allow and what they don't allow. Um, for some, using a, a character string like null is fine. Um, in other systems, you want to have some kind of a, an entry there. And so you need negative 999. Again, we're going to use metadata to say that's what these codes mean, so that if we're looking at our data later, we can answer why, why that looks the way it does. Um, and then in other kinds of cases, like uh, our instrument had an error at this point, or you know some other kind of thing happened, you might use some other code. And using unrealistic values like negative 333 or negative 999 might be a, a good way to do it. Or you can come up with some other convention uh, that works for you and for your systems. So the key point is don't use zero if zero is a relevant value in other cases. Okay. So number four, uh, use metadata, create metadata. Metadata is a little bit of a pain but I guarantee you from working with quite a number of researchers over the years, it's way worse if you get to the end of your project and then you have to create the metadata about everything and you realize you can't remember half the things and so on and so forth. And so there's lots of different ways to create different kinds of metadata. And I, I wasn't gonna go through all the different versions today. Um, many of us are familiar with readme files, for example. Um, there are some versions, again, with uh, spatial data, you have really complex, uh, uh, what are called standards uh, that you write in XML uh, to describe a data set. And in this case, this is just a really simple data dictionary. So this is something, um, or a code book, which is what it's called often in, in social sciences. Um, it's just a way of describing your attribute values, your data values, and your tables, and the definition. And you might provide some kind of a, uh, an example of the range of possible values if you have an enumerated code. like. In this case, they use sex and they have, they tell you what all three of those categories might be. So if you end up looking at that data set and you need to figure it out, um, you've got all that information right there. And so something like this is relatively easy and simple to create. And it's pretty much essential for any kind of tabular data set to have something like this on hand. And so if you're working with a team of people, if you're working with a, an advisor or something like that, a consultant, somebody, um, and you're gonna give them data, um, giving them something like this as well, helps answer a lot of questions they might have about that data set. Uh, and it also helps you kind of talk to them about what the data is and kind of come to a compromise about what the values ought to be. So um, are people familiar with creating metadata generally? Yeah. Data dictionaries? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, really, all you need is another table to create this, or you can create a document. Um, the library is a great example of metadata. Our catalog is just one giant metadata catalog describing our books um, and journals and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are lots of different ways ways to work with metadata. Um, and I guess in, in this one, I was just trying to say, you know, put anything you think is necessary for being able to understand the data set. So it's not just the variable names, it might be uh, the min max values, if there's an acceptable range of values for that, for that particular thing. Um, no values rep representation, as we talked about, um, any code names or anything like that. So there's lots of different ways you can go with this. Um, it's just it's kind of organic to your data set and, and what kinds of values you have. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I think in many cases, if you use different kind of instrumentation, you may have uh, metadata that comes with those instruments so that, you know, processes something and then spits out uh, a bunch of metadata along with that. Um, but in other cases, you're gonna have to generate it yourself and, and track it yourself, particularly common with survey data. Um, if you survey groups of people, you know, what are all those categories, those questions that you asked, all that, that's all metadata. 
Okay. Um, I wanted to talk just briefly about um, thinking through the right tabular format. So if people here are, are used to working in R or working in Python, you might already be familiar with these concepts, but not everybody is. Some people, it's Excel is the primary thing they've worked in. Um, so if you've, if you've dealt with R, you've probably encountered the concept of tidy data. Uh, and tidy data is this one on the right here. Um, which is sometimes also referred to as long format because it ends up being a, a relatively narrow table depending on the number of variables you have and then a really long uh, table of all your observations on each row. Um, the one on the left is something you probably encounter a lot more in the course of sort of day-to-day -day work in a, in a sort of office space or even uh, what people put out in reports and documents and things like that. And that's often referred to as wide format. So there's wide format and long format. Long format is really good for using any kind of tool, um, visualization tool or analysis tool to be able to kind of parse through the observations and then subset things. So if you want to just pull out the Moscow entries and then do something with that, make a table, make a chart, something like that, you could. Uh, wide format is, is really, it's good for human consumption. So you're going to put it in front of somebody they're going to look at it and it makes intuitive sense. We've got the dates along the top. We've got the locations on the side. And it just sort of makes sense there. And so think about what you're producing your data table for. If you're just recording relatively raw data or you're collecting it kind of at the initial stages, I would often recommend you use the tidy format. Uh, if you're getting to the point where you're going to share that with somebody, think about whether that's actually useful to them or you want to convert it into a kind of a wide format. And using tools like R and Python, especially um, flipping back and forth between those is relatively uh, feasible and not too, not too challenging. So if you have experience with, with these tools, you may already know about this, um, but there are some functions, gather, spread, pivot, and melt, kind of depending on the tool you're using, uh, that'll help you kind of make those transitions uh, with your data tables. Uh, any questions or comments about that? Anything online so far? No? Okay. Yeah, so just kind of think through these things as you're going and make sure you're you're choosing the right ways to do things. Um, another issue that comes up a lot are date time formats. Uh, and there is actually a standardized uh, date time format, which I'll show on the next page. But um, any of us that have used Excel, we're familiar with the way that Excel likes to just make things up, it seems. Sometimes it takes your input and then does something completely bizarre with it. So here's a, a range of different ways that they might um, display date and time information. And it's just, it's kind of ridiculous. You pass it to somebody else, then they have to make a bunch of changes to it in order for them to use it and work with it. So um, one of the ways that we can solve this problem, there's an international standard called ISO 8601. This is really common in anything involving the internet behind the scenes pretty much always uses ISO 8601. And there's no good reason why we can't also use it in our in our data tables as well. And so the format, as you can see there, is essentially year, dash, month, dash, date. And then there's some other options for time stamps as well. And so it gives you the full range of expression of international date time in a standardized way. Um, one of the great things about this is if you use this format in almost any tool, uh, that I've ever run into, it is built to understand that, and it will treat that date as a date expressed the way it's supposed to. Um, so if you type that into Excel, Excel might change it in how it's displayed, but behind the scenes, it's still that international uh, date time format. If you use it in R, if you use it in Python, and you try to run methods that are designed to work on dates, like get current year, get current month, get current day, um, it will be able to use this information successfully if it's structured this way. So if you're not familiar with that, it's something to learn about and get used to. Any comments or questions? Okay. Does everybody already do this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tip number seven, uh, 
is assume increasingly that others are going to see your data at some point. So obviously, if you're writing a thesis or a dissertation, your committee is most likely going to see your data at some level or definitely your advisor. Um, but increasingly, if you're also going to be publishing articles out of your work, um, if you're going to go on to a professional career that involves publishing, people are going to want to see your data. It just happens these days. And part of the reason is because funders and journals increasingly are requiring it. It's not an option. Um, I mentioned before I worked with a federal agency and that was the whole that was the whole deal with them. The reason I worked with them is because they were requiring people to share their data and they needed somebody to help them figure out how to do that. Um, so one of the good things about that is if you go into the process knowing that people are going to look at your data and you think through these steps and stages, you can kind of get to a place where you're at least comfortable with it. So you're not feeling like I'm airing my dirty laundry out there into the world and everybody's judging me. You, you'll feel like your, your data is structured well, it's understandable, um, it's reusable by other people if they, they want to do that, um, and it'll help you along. So go into the process of doing research with the assumption that at some point your data will be exposed, and you won't be surprised if it is later on down the road. Yeah. A question about that. Yeah. So are they looking for your initial raw data, well organized or like cleaned data or both? Or? I, I think it, it probably varies. Okay. Um, in most cases, most agencies are not asking you to share raw data. They're they're sharing, they want you to share definitely final products, uh, often summarized kind of data products, and then sometimes kind of earlier stage but cleaned up. And, and processed data sets. Um, it's a little different too when you deal with qualitative data because privacy, confidentiality get into in, into play. But with um, you know biophysical data of various sorts, um, the expectation is you're going to put that out there. And part of the reason for that is there are, and I'm sure we all know um, about all the reproducibility studies that have been done in lots of different fields, and then they found that. Those, those results that people found didn't reproduce. Um, and in many cases, you can't see the data because they didn't save it or they put it somewhere and they don't know where to find it. And so there's, there's a credibility problem and an evidence problem in a lot of fields. Um, so kind of working through these processes and steps will hopefully help you avoid some of those problems down the road. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, and I, I pulled up one example from, this is a little more relevant a couple of years ago during COVID. <laughs> but, um, there was a, yeah, there was a study in, in nature medicine that addressed exactly this point, which is that they wanted to be able to look at this data because this was a major controversial issue. And the point is that people are asking for it. People are looking for it. These weren't funders, these weren't journals, these were other people in the field. Uh, and so, especially if you have important and interesting and um, significant results that come out of your work, people are going to want to look under the hood and see what's, what's going on. And so those are the seven tips that I had in mind uh, to share with everyone. So back up your data using some kind of a three, two, one rule. So three copies, two uh, on different storage media, and one offsite through some some mechanism. Uh, don't modify raw data, just version your data as you go throughout the process, create sub uh, create, uh, versions of the data sets. Uh, be intentional with your data values. So use your kind of thoughtful data values, use good naming practices. Uh, don't use zero if it's not, um, uh, if it doesn't mean no uh, observation. Um, just be intentional and thoughtful with it. Um, create metadata, including data dictionaries and code books. Um, think about that long versus wide format that can kind of save your bacon a little bit in terms of how you arrange data on a table. Um, think about your standardized date time formats that should say date, not data time formats. And then uh, assume others will be able to see your data at some point uh, and act accordingly. So, any questions from anybody? Um, anybody online too? Do you recommend 
taking your modified version from backing them up three, two, one again? Like, well, I think I think ideally, um, if anymore, if you're using, if you've got whatever you've got on your computer, you've probably got a cloud version in many cases uh, of the which would sort of do that offsite part of it. Uh, then the real question is like a like an external hard drive or something. How often should you do that? I mean, it might come back to um, to something like this. Whenever you have a kind of major milestone in your process, that's when you want to maybe capture it. Um, or if, <laughs> if you just put in a ton of work on something one day and you were like, I just got to save this just in case. I don't, I don't want any mistakes, anything going wrong. So um, it's, it's really just a matter of, I mean, figuring out what works best for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Any, anything online from anyone? Okay. Well, um, as I said earlier, uh, we've got a location uh, over here in the map room of the library. I'm there uh, a few days during the week at the desk. If you have any questions about data management, you're also welcome to just email me out of the blue. If you have very specific questions about something that I've had questions about camera trap photos and all sorts of other things in the past. And so sometimes, yeah, it's just a custom question that requires a, a little bit of a special answer. Um, so yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. Um, we have one more workshop in this session coming up. That's next week. And that's going to be really GIS oriented. So if you're interested in that, our GIS librarian will teach that. And he does a really good job. So um, if you haven't met him, and you do GIS, show up to this one. <laughs> It'll be worth it. Um, I also wanted to put in a plug for, uh, I mentioned the Data Hub, and we actually have a workshop series coming. They can't see the browser. Oh, they can't see the browser. Okay, let me just, you're gonna see under the, the hood here. Um, let's just share the screen at this point. Okay, can they see that? Okay. So from the library's website, if you go down to the event calendar here, we'll just pop into the calendar. And we've got this blue series starting up here. So I will just click here. Uh, we've got a set of different workshops coming up that are uh, part of our Data Hub series. So again, this is support for data science and, and GIS work. Um, kind of across the board. So we've got uh, workshops on using OpenRefine, which is a great tool for cleaning data. Um, if you don't know about it, I'd say check it out. Uh, we've got one on qualitative data analysis software coming up. Uh, we've got one on using some special demographic data sets from uh, the company that provides a lot of our GIS software. Uh, we've got a couple of AI workshops on different kinds of mo uh, models. So one's on uh, well diffusion models, so creating images from text. And another one is transformer models, which is behind a lot of what we're seeing with uh, GPT and other things like that. Um, so how those models work should be really cool. And then we'll have one uh, towards the end on some AI tools for working with research literature and doing literature reviews. Um, so check those out if you're interested, you can register for them uh, and hopefully they are useful to you. It's all on the library's website. So with that, I will leave it and say, uh, please get in touch if you have any questions. And thanks for coming. <laughs>